In the previous discussion, we have explored the behavior of magnetically ordered material upon varying the temperature. We have seen that in all those materials, it's always possible to define a temperature below which the magnetic order is preserved and above which thermal fluctuation kill the magnetic order. What I would like to do now is to take a closer look at what is actually happening at this phase transition. What we are going to see is that in spite of the high complexity of the magnetic material, it is possible to identify a universal behavior. Let's look at that. In the previous lecture, we computed the temperature dependence of the magnetization of a ferromagnet in the mean field theory. We obtained the following graph, which shows a progressive reduction of the magnetization upon increasing the temperature until it reaches zero at Curie temperature. Now, what actually happens close to the Curie temperature? We can get some concrete idea by looking at the pictures on the right, taken from a recent work from Saras and co-workers. On the top panels, you have Monte Carlo simulations of the spatial distribution of the magnetization of a ferromagnet as a function of the temperature. And at the bottom panel, you have the experimental imaging of an iron copper bar layer obtained by scanning electron microscopy, also upon increasing temperature. What you see is that the ferromagnet shows magnetic domain fluctuations. These fluctuations are thermally activated so that the size of the magnetic domain reduces upon increasing the temperature. Close to Curie temperature, you have so many small domain fluctuations that the overall magnetization of the system vanishes. Notice that small magnetic domains survive even above Curie temperature, but they fluctuate so much that the average magnetization remains zero. What we would like now is a theory to explain this behavior close to current temperature. The simpler theory that treats the behavior of the magnetic order parameter close to the phase transition is due to Landau. You will see that this theory is extremely simple, much simpler than the brilliant theory for ferromagnetism that we have seen previously. Yet, its consequences are extremely powerful. So, let's consider the free energy of a magnetic material defined by its order parameter m. In the absence of magnetic field, the free energy is even in magnetization reversal. In other words, if you have a magnetic sample in your hand, its energy does not depend on how you hold it. So, close to current temperature, where the magnetic order is very small, I can expand this energy in the small parameter m. I'll get a simple polynomial with only even powers of the magnetization. Let's analyze this super simple polynomial graphically. If A and B are both positive, I obtain the black curve, and minimizing the energy gives me the solution M equals zero. So a priori, this polynomial describes the solution of my ferromagnets above current temperature. Now, if A is negative but B remains positive, I obtain the red curve and minimizing the energy gives me a non-zero magnetization M. In other words, this polynomial describes the solution of my ferromagnet below current temperature. Therefore, I can conclude that if I want to describe the transition from ferromagnetic to paramagnetic phase, I can fix B positive and I can take A as a linear function of the temperature, like that. This ultra crude model should describe how the magnetization behaves close to current temperature. Let's do it then. By minimizing the free energy for A equal A prime times T minus Tc, I obtain the magnetization below current temperature that scales like the square root of Tc minus T. This is exactly what I obtain with my much more complex mean field theory. It's really impressive that the crudest model you can think of give the same result as statistical quantum mechanics. You can also compute the specific heat as the second order derivative of the free energy with respect to temperature. We obtain a linear increase 
up to current temperature, followed by a drop to zero above current temperature. And this is very close to what is observed experimentally. Now let's consider the susceptibility. We simply add a Zeeman term to our free energy. Neglecting the quartic term, we obtain the well-known Curie-Weiss law that we obtained already in the previous lecture via the Brian formula. Now we need to make a conceptual leap to relate this susceptibility with the fluctuations observed experimentally. This conceptual leap is contained in the fluctuation dissipation theorem. There are many versions of the theorem depending on the specific context. The theorem establishes a connection between the susceptibility of a system to an external bias and its ability to dissipate energy. In the case of magnetic materials, it states that the susceptibility is directly related to the magnetic fluctuations. Therefore, since the susceptibility diverges at current temperature, it means that the fluctuations diverge, which is typically what is observed experimentally and through the Monte Carlo simulations. The divergence of the magnetic fluctuations close to current temperature has a very important consequence on the systematic behavior of the magnetic system. If you take a magnetic material below current temperature, its correlation length is infinite because the magnetic order is the same everywhere, and its thermal behavior is described by its microscopic properties, as we have seen in the previous lecture. If you consider this magnetic system above current temperature, it is in the paramagnetic phase, and the fluctuations are so strong that there is no correlation between the magnetic domains. In other words, the correlation length between these domains vanishes. Now, if you lower the temperature from the paramagnetic phase and get closer to the current temperature, the correlation length increases and diverges towards infinity in the ferromagnetic phase. Therefore, the length scale that controls magnetism is no more the microscopic scale of the interatomic magnetic interactions, but rather the microscopic scale of the correlation length. As a result, the magnetic system will tend to follow a universal behavior independent on its microscopic properties. Different materials with completely different electronic band structure can show exactly the same scaling behavior close to the transition point. This critical scaling of the various magnetic properties of a system is described by these formulas. The exponents alpha, beta, gamma, and delta are called critical exponents and are all related to each other via renormalization group theory. It is remarkable that in these relations, the dimensionality of the system plays an important role. The systems that display the same critical behavior are said to belong to the same universality class. This universality class is defined in terms of special dimensionality and number of degrees of freedom. As a concrete example, let's consider the critical exponents of several model systems. The first column here shows the mean field theory discussed in the previous lecture. The second column shows the critical exponent for the Heising model that we also discussed at the end of the previous lecture. And the third column is the result obtained using the Heisenberg Hamiltonian. Now, the last column shows the result for bulk nickel. What is striking is that you see directly that nickel does not belong to the universality class defined by the mean field theory. It is actually closer to the Heisenberg model than to the mean field theory. A beautiful demonstration of the universal behavior of magnetic materials across current temperature was obtained by Milosevic and Stanley in 1976. This graph gathers the reduced magnetization as a function of the reduced temperature for five different magnetic compounds. Here we have chromium bromide, which is a magnetic material with strong anisotropy. We have europium oxide, which is a magnetic insulator governed by superexchange. We have nickel, which is a 19 ferromagnet. 
yttrium iron garnet, which is um, an insulating ferry magnet, and finally, uh, iron palladium, which is a ferromagnetic alloy. Remarkably, when one measures the magnetization as a function of the temperature, all these data fall under one curve described by the Heisenberg model, irrespective of their different microscopic exchange interactions. Another nice example is a work by Christian Bach and co-workers published in Science in 1995. The authors measured the temperature dependence of the magnetization of an ultra-thin layer of iron deposited on tungsten substrate. This system is expected to behave like a two-dimensional magnet. The results are given here for two different samples. When you plot these results on the same graph, you obtain once again a universal scaling that fits the one obtained by the two-dimensional Ising model. So that's another beautiful example of universality class at a critical point. To complete this discussion on phase transitions, I'd like to mention a very important theorem that has been very influential in magnetism. The theorem, due to Mermin and Wagner, states that no magnetism survives in isotropic Heisenberg models in one and two dimensions. Let's take a regular isotropic Heisenberg Hamiltonian with exchange interaction between neighboring spins. We are now going to allow for the spins to fluctuate while keeping their magnitude constant. So the number of degrees of freedom per spin is two associated with the two transverse components of the spin. I can perform a spin wave expansion where sigma x and sigma y quantify the fluctuations, and I can rewrite the Heisenberg Hamiltonian as a function of these fluctuations. You directly see that I can minimize the energy by allowing for spatial fluctuation of the magnetic order. If I calculate the magnitude of these fluctuations, I end up with a divergence at finite temperature. This means that no long-range order, either ferro, ferry, or antiferromagnetic, survives in isotropic one- or two-dimensional magnets. One can obtain an upper boundary condition for the magnetic order in one- and two-dimensions. Here you can see that Sz can never reach its maximum value which means that at finite temperature, no spontaneous magnetism emerges. This forbidden rule is associated with the excitation of Goldson modes, which are zero energy excitations. For even very tiny temperature, such magnetic fluctuations are excited and the magnetic order is destroyed. But this doesn't mean that there is no magnetism in low dimension. To stabilize magnetism, what you need to do is simply to prevent these Goldstone modes to get excited. This can be done by turning on the magnetocrystalline anisotropy. In this case, the magnetic excitations can only be excited above a certain temperature, which then defines the ordering of the system. In the past couple of years, the field of two-dimensional magnetism has experienced a massive boost with the discovery of two-dimensional magnetism at decent temperatures. Here I show one of the most prominent results obtained recently by Huang and co-workers. They reported ferromagnetism in chromium iodine monolayers with a current temperature estimated at 45 Kelvin. Reports of magnetism at room temperature in transition metal calcogenides monolayers have also been published. These open threading perspectives for spintronics at the atomic limit. We have seen that close to the transition temperature, magnetically ordered material display general behavior that are characterized by their universality class independently of their microscopic interactions. This general behavior is coming from, from the fact that close to the transition temperature, the correlation length between fluctuating magnetic domains diverges. And therefore, the physics that is governing the behavior of those magnetic materials changes completely. 
Now that we have a good understanding of the equilibrium properties of magnetic materials, in the next lecture, I would like to address the dynamical properties. So we are going to talk about landau lewis gilbert equation, about micromagnetics, about magnetization switching, and about ferromagnetic resonance. So let's move on.